Um, our next speaker is Julie Duell, uh, who is Greg Miller Visiting Professor here at the University this semester, I believe. Um, Julian has been writing about life and death online since almost before there was an internet, or before, certainly before there was a world wide web. Um, his iconic piece, uh, A Rape in Cyberspace, which was later expanded to his book, My Tiny Life, um, is sort of you know, one of the definitive accounts of how, as the subtitle put it, uh, how a database uh, became a society. Basically, Julian has been writing about um, virtual selves and online persona for 17 years or more, um, and is going to talk a bit about today about uh, death in the context of video games online. Julian? about $4,000 a month in profits. Um, made a total through the year of $11,000. It was a pretty steep learning curve there where I wasn't making a lot of money. Um, and, and you know, eventually I kept a blog of the experience and eventually wrote a book about it. Um, this is called Play Money or How I Quit My Day Job and Made Millions Trading Virtual Loot. Um, so this was a big deal for me. This was a, a major, significant portion of my life. For a writer, having a book out is a, is a, is a rather large deal, in fact, um, beyond what, what money you make on it, a very meaningful moment. Um, and, but, but this episode is, is, is a conversation for another day and another talk, and I've, I've given lots of them on this. Uh, what I want to talk about now is, is the moment that led me down the path to becoming this guy, Al Hanud, this formidable figure in the game. And you can see I have a castle here. Um, these are my, my minions here who buy and sell my stuff for me when I'm away, little robot guys who man the castle for me. Am I, am I doubling up against this mic? Is that what's happening? Maybe I can. Well, um, sorry, still, I mean, I'm better with the Wii console, but here. OK, so uh, this is me sort of roaming the town. This is actually another property of mine. I was a big landowner in this game. Um, I was a big deal, but in the beginning, I was no sort of big deal at all. You start out very low on the totem pole. And I spent a lot of my time um, as an early character in the game. I didn't even have a home, let alone a castle. Um, my character slept at night in little squalid inns um, shared with other newbie players. Um, 
And to try to get ahead, I spent a lot of time going to this dungeon called Despise, um, where you could go in and there were a lot of these guys, lizard men. Um, and at first, um, as I would fight them, they would clean my clock. They would kill me regularly and I died over and over again to them. But I eventually got more powerful versus them and was able to establish kind of a racket in, uh, this, is an, this is them in, in full um, terif terrifying mode. Um, killing these guys en masse in, inside the dungeon to spies and uh, skinning them and selling their lizards Lizard's, spined lizard skin hide um, to a guy who I think was in Eastern Europe who would give me 30,000 gold pieces for a thousand of, of these hides. Um, so it was, a, it was a regular satisfying routine and it was pleasurable to kill them. And, and, uh, and uh, so one day as I went back to there uh, to, to, to continue my business of slaying lizard men, um, a shadowy figure appeared next to me down here. This is a total reenactment um, with photoshopped up. I, don't, I didn't, didn't have the wherewithal to record this as it was happening. Um, but this was approximately what happened. Um, shadowy figure appears, um, uh, addresses me in ominous tones, hey ya, uh, he said. Um, and what happens when you talk in this game is, is a little, uh, some, some words appear above your character's head and that's how you know people are talking to you. So this is one of the other players in the game. Um, so I said, you know, hey, you're back. And, um, and then he followed by saying corp poor, which I, I was barely beginning able to understand was not uh, just a, you know, a, a friendly um, comment. It was actually, he was casting a spell. Um, soon after that, a bolt of lightning shot out and my speakers rumbled as, as I was zapped by this incredibly powerful spell and saw my hit points, my life bar start to go down. Um, and realized that for the first time in the game, I was under attack by another player, not just a lousy little lizard man that I could, you know, take care of. This guy was taking me down. Um, and by then it was pretty much too late. He was a much more powerful mage than I was. And here, you know, there wasn't, this is the little sort of overhead map of where I was. And you can see there wasn't a lot of places to run. I, but I ran like crazy, hoping he couldn't really get his cursor on me, but he did. Um, and that was that, I was dead. You are dead, that's how you know. The screen goes gray, and you appear standing next to your corpse as a little ghost. Um, and you can see the guy, the creep, the jackass, the jerk who killed you, uh, standing next to the body, and you can hear what he's saying. And at, the, at this time, he's saying things like, you know, noob, and he threw in some choice uh, obscenities. Um, he was very disappointed in what I had in my backpack for him to loot. And so just out of spite, he killed my horse, which was totally unnecessary. And I'm returning the obscenities, um, except the problem is when you're dead, they see your ghost, but whatever you say, all that appears is kind of ooh, so I'm like, ah, and he's just like. Um, so this was a special moment. I'd never been killed by another player before. And as I logged off that night, I just kind of sat and played through the emotions that had gone through me as this was happening. And they were quite impressive. You know, it, was, it wasn't pleasurable at all, but it, there was kind of a visceral thrill to it. And more than that, there was a real sense of being suddenly grounded in this game in ways that I hadn't understood before, that I, I was suddenly made to understand my place in this social structure, this game. I was at the very bottom of the rung. I had been owned in the parlance of gamers by this guy. Um, and, and it felt very real. It plugged into some very deep sort of limbic parts of my brain, the kind of monkey troop part of your brain that really does not want to be at the bottom of the hierarchy, wants to be at the top, wants to strive, wants to be able to someday go back and either own this guy in turn or show them that you own much more than he can possibly ever own. And so that was a big deal. That was a significant moment. It was the moment when I started to think, I can't let go of this game. I need to figure out some way to make it productive, to have some excuse to be in here and feel like I'm making more than just an imaginary career out of it. And that was 
sort of the turning point that led to the experiment that led to this, you know, very significant moment in my life, the publication of this book and, and the insights that I got out of the whole experience. All of which is by way of addressing one question that we could ask about death in video games. How significant could it possibly be? How meaningful could a death in a video game possibly be? Um, how, let, me, let me ask this question and let me put it this way. How many of you have never played a video game in which your character can die? Right, and, and, and how many of you have never played a game in, in which your character can die and has died, right? It's ha one or two people raise their hands, um, but almost everybody has had this experience now. This is an almost universal experience of dying in video games, and it happens all the time, and life goes on, right? So how meaningful could it be? So this is one answer to that question, it can be pretty meaningful. At least in my case, it was quite, this particular death was a meaningful moment. But there's a larger question here I want to get at, which is that what does all this dying mean? Not any one particular game, death, but the fact that it's happening over and over, thousands of times. I would love to have a great one of these, you know, people in TED Talks are always trotting out wonderful statistics, and I would love to have some statistic that said, since, you know, the invention of video, video games in 1954, you know, 2.3 billion deaths have occurred, you know, just, I don't. I could come up with one, it would be totally back of the envelope and ridiculous, but it would be huge. There's been a ton of dying. What does it mean? I want to kind of angle at that question. I don't know if I have any real answers, um, but, I'm going to nose around it and, and, and look for clues. Wait, I'm going backwards again. Here we go. So one of the ways I thought about getting at this question was to look at the larger question of not just death in video games, but death in games, per se. Um, and this turns out to be, looking at this turns out to be an interesting clue uh, because it turns out that there actually isn't death in games before video games. You know, I, I, I sort of assumed this was a big question we could talk about, but when I went to look back at the historical record, I found there was almost nothing prior to video games. There is the, the closest thing, maybe, uh, on one level, uh, is the game of shoots and ladders, which began life in ancient India as a kind of uh, allegory of, of death and reincarnation for, to teach young kids about karma. So, you know, you would do good deeds and climb up higher, but it was much easier to, to get on the, on the snakes, snakes and ladders, they called it, um, and fall back, you know, and come back after death as, as something much less than you were in life. Close. Other than that, though, nothing really like the death we have in video games. Like, you are identified with a character that dies other than, sorry about this, Keep going backwards when I'm going to go forwards. Uh, other than this, this is the only game, and, and maybe Operation, I suppose, although that's the, that's the patient on the table, that's not you. So you're identified with the doctor in, in Operation rather than the patient. And Hangman is the only game, and I, I, I'm, I'd be delighted to hear any examples anybody else can come up with, of people, of games where you, as a single character, die. There are war games, of course, but the whole units die in that, you know, masses of people, and you're just sort of the general sort of overseeing it. It's a curious thing. It's almost, you know, you wouldn't have thought about it prior to the latter half of the 20th century, but now that death is such an integral part of what most people experience as gaming, it looks weird. It looks almost like a bizarre taboo. You know, wh why? It's almost as if there was something so wrong about, you know, injecting something so fateful, so existentially fraught into something so inconsequential, so essentially inconsequential as games that no one dared to do it. 
Conversely then, on the other hand, what's curious is that almost as soon as there are computers, and almost as soon as people start making games on them, um, we have death in video games as we know it. Uh, the first couple games, I think there was a tic-tac-toe game in the 50s, um, and maybe a table tennis game. But the first one that really shows up in the historical record as meaningful is Space War, created in 1962. And it was, it was a little uh, space war, very crude graphics. You know, you, were, you faced your opponent in a little uh, 2D spaceship, and you shot little dot, 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 dot. And, and when you landed a hit, the spaceship blew up. And you know, clearly, you as the pilot were dead. Um, the next game, next big game in the historical record is, is a game called Colossal Cave Adventure. Some of you know this game as adventure. Um, it's, the, it's, the, it's really the historical root of games like Ultima Online, these adventuring in the wilderness games. So you, you log in and you are, you know, it says you're inside a building, a well house, you can pick up stuff, move around. Um, you, here I, just to give you a sense of the play, um, you can wander around, and here you see now, almost immediately, you get into a place where it is now pitch black. If you proceed, you will likely fall into a pit. Um, there's a rod, I pick that up, get rod, um, and I go west, I type a little W just to proceed, and immediately, there I go, fall into a pit, break every bone in my body. That's death is built into this in a big way. And from there on, you know, these are sort of space war and adventure are the two you know, founding pillars of, of video game design. Um, and death is with us everywhere in, you know, in games after that. You know, from, the, from the silliest, goofiest Super Mario thing, I couldn't find a really good image of Mario dying, but there's the snakes and the cactuses to let you know it's, 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 he's definitely at risk of dying and may die any moment and will die many times over. And the whole point is to get extra lives, to not die quite so much. Um, this is a shot from Halo, very dramatic. In, in Halo, what happens is you know, you're seeing yourself in first person. And suddenly, when you get shot, the camera pulls back, and you get this dramatic, here's blood you know, shooting off the guy. And he's falling to his knees. And it's all very Shakespearean, um, but also very uh, useful, because you can see then how you were shot you know, from the perspective of your shooter. Um, here is a, a very dramatic shot in my favorite game now, World of Warcraft. This is my character after death. And it's, it's so arty, you can't really see what's going on. Um, but again, the screen goes gray, and you have to go visit a, a ghost. And, but, but with all the mechanics overlaid of what you normally see on the screen, all this, you still see it's like play money, that's my character, died. It's the same thing as, as in adventure. Um, and, and so. With three minutes left, let me try to come back to this question of what does this mean, all this dying? Uh, the first thing we might ask is, well, certainly it's meaningful in the context of the most common discussion about video games, which is about violence in video games, you know, which is focused almost entirely on all this killing that goes on in video games. Uh, with almost no acknowledgement of the fact that so much dying goes on in video games. More often, you are dying almost than killing people. And how does that relate to that? I mean, and to the extent that this is studied, there's a Finnish study that came out a couple years ago um, where, you know, these psychologists hooked players up who were playing a game like, um, like uh, Halo, um, a first-person shooter, as they call it, and, and studying their reactions. And they found that actually by the physiological measures that they could measure, death was the pleasurable part. Death induced pleasure. Killing, not so much. Killing kind of made people squicky. And you can sort of say, look at that and find encouragement. You know, that in fact, we're not being desensitized to killing. Um, it's, it's hard to kill in video games. The problem is, Death is so tied up with game mechanics that it's hard to say, separate that out from you know, the mechanics of gameplay itself. Well, are you, pleasure, are you feeling pleasure because 
you're released from you know, this obligation to kill? Or are you feeling pleasure because it's a break from the tension of worrying that you're about to be killed or that you're about to lose? It's hard to generalize. It's hard to separate out death as an object in these, in these games and think about them. There are a lot of games themselves. Whoops, backwards, backwards, backwards. A lot of games now that try to do this. This is a game called Passage that's about kind of, you know, it's a very uh, simple game that lasts about five minutes. Uh, there's not much you can do. You can either get married or not in this game, but you're moving, always moving forward. And you die in the end, you just die. Um, and it's a little bit different if you get married and a little, a little harder, but a little less lonely and otherwise. Uh, you know, so he's trying to focus, the, the Jason Rohr, the artist who created this, is trying to focus you on, on, on death itself. There's a similar game called uh, The Graveyard and uh, there's not much more to it than this screenshot. The, the little old lady walks around the graveyard for a while, um, sits and looks at the pigeons. Um, and that's the trial version. If you buy the demo, you get one added feature, which is that she can die. Um, and there are a lot of games like this now, but, but what they're doing is not getting at my question, and, uh, which I will round up in the, you know, the few seconds of overtime that I have now, um, which is, what about death in video games? This is kind of getting you to think about death per se. What about death in video games. And all I can say is there's only, there's so much variation in the way that death plays out in games that it's hard to generalize about what it means from game to game. But one generalization we can make is that death is everywhere in video games. It's ubiquitous in games. And one other generalization we can make is, is the one that I already make, which is that it only appears in games after computers emerge. And so the one lesson or thought I can sort of derive from that is that there's something about computers and their relationship to death that is being engaged in this phenomenon. Alan Turing, the guy who sort of scoped out the logic of computers when he first started designing and theorizing them, basically defined them as a kind of simulation machine. They can simulate any process and immediately what he got to thinking about as a result of that was, can they simulate the mind? Can they simulate the workings of the mind? And so he wrote some very interesting things about artificial intelligence um, and the possibility and, and the assumption that in theory we can ultimately create mind in computers, which leads immediately to a whole line of thinking um, among computer engineers and, and uh, people like that, uh, that it's going to be possible someday for us to actually upload our consciousness, right, as bits and bytes onto sophisticated computers in which we will, which we will then inhabit as mind. And that's very exciting to them, but one thing that I've often thought about over the years is that what does this do for the body? It makes it this sort of expendable appendage. And how likely is it that we will not, in fact, someday arrive at a leisure industry that offers us the option of dying as a thrill, as an entertainment? You know, jump off a cliff, experience that. Uh, you know, face a firing squad, experience that. This is a new kind of relationship to death. I think it's interesting that, uh, you know, the only other example we can come up with in games prior to this is, is, is from the Hindu culture, you know, where, where we have a very diff where there's a very different relationship to death uh, in the body than what we have in the West. Um, and so I, I, I would suggest that what is all this dying means is that we live in a culture in which the computer and its logic has become to inform us and begins to inform our ideas about death and the body, um, subject for future research. And now on to other kinds of dying.